Uh, I, my name is Ernest Wilson. I'm director of the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. And I want to invite you to uh, what I think is going to be a very exciting uh, discussion. Um, this is part of an initiative that, uh, that we're trying to pursue here. It's one of the early parts of the initiative. And the idea is to um, really act on the notion of convergence and coming together. And the Annenberg School for Communication, as you know, consists of a journalism school and a communication school. And we also have strategic public relations and we have public diplomacy. In other words, we are a converged school. And it just so happens that the universe is also converging in terms of business models and technologies and platforms. And so increasingly, it perhaps makes less and less sense for us not to take advantage of the fact that we are all in one institution that has journalism and communication and public relations, et cetera. So these are efforts to begin conversations among students and faculty that cut across those silos. And so we're really delighted that uh, Professor Henry Jenkins has agreed to be the first victim, um, excuse me, the first leader, <laughs> the first leader in this uh, initiative. Um, before we start, though, I do want to uh, thank uh, Dean Abby Kahn for uh, putting this together. Thank you, Abby, for making this possible. We call this One Book, One School initiative, but I sort of had a certain <laughs> elegance. I was thinking one book, one school, one people, one nation. <laughs> but um, it's going to be a, a great event. I also understand there are some uh, students visiting from near and far who are considering uh, the Annenberg School. Could I, could you raise your hand if you are visiting from near and far? Okay, those of you from, thank you very much. Those of you from near and far, welcome uh, to the Annenberg School. And we do stuff like this every day. So <laughs> why you should come. Actually, we do. Actually, we do. That's the scary part we actually do. Um, so let, let me just say that uh, books emerge out of specific social institutional, intellectual, and personal contexts. They just don't pop up out of thin air. And for those of you who are budding scholars and budding journalists and writers, uh, as you pursue your career, you will discover that all of these things impinge on the character and quality of our intellectual work. And so what we want to do today with uh, Professor Jenkins uh, is ask him to talk a little bit about these uh, coincidences and convergences in his own life, uh, in his own professional life, um, before coming to Annenberg. I do have to say that a number of us mounted a full court press. I think Geneva, you went up to Cambridge at one point, and I know uh, Larry was there as well in order to convince our brother that this would be a much better place to be than cold old Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> Um, and so he has been a wonderful a colleague and a wonderful citizen and continues to be a wonderful teacher and intellectual. So with that, I will shut up and turn the floor over to Professor Henry Jenkins. So, well, so, so the part of the format is I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about how this book came to be written and what it means and the trajectory that took me from MIT to USC. And then we're going to hear from some of the students that I've worked with since I've come here to Annenberg and how different ideas in the book have impacted the research we're doing together and their personal research toward their dissertations and individual projects. Um, because I, I, you know, this, books don't get written in a vacuum. Th that convergence culture really grew out of the conversations I had at MIT with students there, many of whom I'm still working with closely on various initiatives and so forth. And I remember when I decided to leave um, MIT to come to USC, I said, C convergence culture is the culmination of who Henry was at MIT. And I'm very curious, to see, very curious to see who I am at USC because I could not have written, I had arrived at MIT 24 years ago and the, at the beginning of the digital revolution. I'd been lucky to be attached to the MIT Media Lab and to be engaged with conversations there, which pulled me into the digital at a really fast pace. I never used email before I arrived at MIT. Uh, Amy Bruckman, who's now a quite famous media scholar, set up my first email 
account for me. And uh, I went away one summer and came back and there were 50 pieces of email in my box. And I was just ranting about how could this possibly be? <laughs> and, and Amy just said, just wait. And I probably had 50 pieces come through this morning before I left to come, to come down here. This book I wrote at a cabin in the North Georgia mountains and the foothills of the Appalachia. I lived by myself for a year on leave. My nearest neighbor was two miles away, and I wrote it using a dial-up computer. Um, I sort of, I think of it as my Walden Pond moment. <laughs> and I think of Ralph Waldo Emerson as the dial-up computer that Henry Thoreau had access to when, when he wrote Walden. Uh, one narrow pipeline with very, very clear filters that determined what information he had access to. Um, but it really, as I said, it was written in part as growing out of a series of columns I'd done for Technology Review Magazine, which was a publication of MIT. It grew out of developing and thinking about the Comparative Media Studies program, which had really encouraged me to move from someone who studied a lot of media in isolation to someone who studied media in relationship to each other. And that was the logic that drove my focus on convergence. For those of you who haven't had a chance to read the book, Here's my one minute pre of the book. The essential argument is that convergence is a process and an ongoing process, not an endpoint. That it's a cultural process, a social process, as much as it's a technological process. It's a process that changes how we access media in a world where media is going to flow across every available channel through any and every means possible, both legal and illegal. And the flow will be shaped as much by what teenagers do in their bedrooms is what corporations do in their boardrooms. It's about collective intelligence and how we process knowledge together within a network culture and the kinds of entertainment that facilitates, namely transmedia entertainment, media entertainment that links pieces of stories together across media platforms. And by learning to play together with that, those kinds of new entertainment experiences, we're developing new ways of learning and new ways of relating to each other, which in turn would, I was predicting, impact politics, education, religion, and business. And in the course of the book, we trace all of those things. So flip forward to the present. So one of the things that was hitting me as that book was coming out, I was waiting for the book to come out. And there's a sense of your information is rotting, right? You finish this book on very contemporary developments, and the world is changing. So during the time the book's about to come out, the term Web 2.0 gets coined. Uh, YouTube begins to become a phenomenon. Social media, MySpace, and then later Facebook start to take, take off. So these are pretty significant changes. After that, we start to see Twitter. We see the rise, fall, and maybe the rise again of Second Life. Uh, as I'm finishing the book up, uh, the press asked me to write two paragraphs on the iPod, because they wanted to put an iPod on the cover of the book. And it was the only updating I was allowed to do while creating this book. So, but I think that the overall logic of the book, this focus on participatory culture as it relates to entertainment culture, the idea that you know, I was hearing people say, we live in a world without gatekeepers. Anyone can create media and share it with anyone they want on whatever scale they want. And I said, yeah, that's about right. Then I read someone else say, we live in a world where five to seven corporations control all the media that the society receives. And that concentration has an enormous consequences on the messages we're getting. And I'm going, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, how do we reconcile those two things? And what's the relationship between those, those phenomena? And that's really at the heart of the book. And what interests me was the argument that we're moving toward a world that will be ever more participatory, but the terms of our participation are up for grabs. So next, I have a book coming out in January called Spreadable Media, Creating Value and Meaning in a Network Society, which in some ways updates convergence culture. I, I can't simply describe it in that way. I have two co-authors, Sam Ford and Joshua Green, who worked with me on, uh, on, at the Convergence Culture Consortium, which was our attempt at MIT to take the ideas in the book and really engage with industry in dialogue and challenge a lot of the thinking inside the industry. And out of that process came this new book that we've written, which very much is about what happens to everything in here once we add social media to the mix. And it's, it's, if this book's about reception and production, that book is about circulation and how does changes in circulation uh, affect, how media circulates affect how we determine the value and significance of media. 
Um, but as I think about the bibliography of that book, you can start to see that it consolidates all these students and faculty that I worked with at MIT and all the stuff I was teaching there, but it's the book in transition because it's been written over the last four years so that there's an enormous amount of USC Annenberg people and cinema school people that I've worked with starting to find their way into the, that book. And now the books I'm beginning, the next books I'm working on, I've got three projects in the pipeline, the next books will be fully Annenberg and the process of becoming and Annenberg, USC driven faculty and how that changes the way I write is something that's still unfolding and still exploring. But part of what allows me to write those books is that I've had the privilege of working with these remarkable PhD students um, here at, at U USC, both from the cinema school and from communication and now from education that are really shaping my thinking in profound ways and building on the ideas in the book. And so I thought rather than listening to me rattle on, uh, which I would, I would, we, we would bring together some of those students to share their stories of what this book meant to them and where they're taking the ideas in the book in new directions. And so let me turn it over to you. <laughs> My name is Francesca Marie Smith. I'm a third year PhD student here working uh, with Henry um, on a number of things. For me, convergence culture has been uniquely valuable in a couple of different ways. The first is that it really gave me an unbelievable uh, vocabulary and a very powerful theoretical model um, and his framework of critical utopianism in particular that has helped me make a transition from my longtime identity uh, <coughs> as a creator in the entertainment industry, moving more towards a scholarly perspective and figuring out how to have better conversations about fans, about consumers, how to have more respectful dialogues with that side of the industry that I feel very often gets overlooked um, and moving the media industry forward as we do so. So it was very important for me uh, personally to facilitate my intersectional identity, sort of uh, bringing together the media industry, scholarship, um, and the perspective of the fan and consumer, which I think is something Henry does remarkably well and uniquely. Perhaps more tangibly, I found convergence culture to be um, really inspirational in my research here. I, I write on disability rhetoric, and I think that Disability rhetoric, much like race and gender rhetoric, has, uh, has been marked by a distinct criticism of negative representations of these marginalized groups in the popular media. The problem specifically for disability scholars is we don't know what a positive representation would look like. There's really been very little agreement about that. I think convergence culture and the ideas contained therein might actually provide one of the only answers that I've settled on thus far as to what, how we might get to more positive representations of disability in the media because it highlights ways that consumers can make their own meaning out of texts, can empower themselves to speak to media producers in more collaborative and productive ways to create their own idea of what a positive image might look like. Um, and those are really exciting implications, I, th I think, for me. So just to give you a quick overview of what that kind of research might look like, I've been writing for the past few months um, about Batman a lot, incidentally, and the Joker as a central figure in the Batman universe. It's pretty archetypally a villain character, but I think when you look at it through a transmedia lens, you gain a greater appreciation for how incredibly nuanced and complex the story of the Joker has become over the decades it's been explored in comics, graphic novels, television shows, movies, <coughs> movies uh, and what have you. So if we think about it like we think about The Matrix or Star Wars or any of the other examples Henry has in the book, we recognize that all of a sudden the Joker has multiple origin stories, multiple explanations for why he does the things he does, whether he's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder after the, the killing of his wife and family, or whether he's just plain evil, or whether he has some other mental illness that could have been treated. And so we start exploring these different understandings, a very complex understanding of behavior beyond just uh, black and white, good and evil. And that, I think, is so much closer to what we might be facing in the real world that it gives us incredible tools for understanding the real world. And similarly, thinking about what a fan might do with that, it allows them to take that nuanced understanding of the Joker or any other character, come to their own conclusions about what that kind of character might do, how we might start tweaking little things in the universe, what would be different if the Joker had made different choices or got better <coughs> mental care, start writing fan fiction or participate in their own games in that new world, which is a, an unbelievably thrilling way of engaging with the material, getting new pleasure and meaning out of it. But lastly, what I think is so exciting about it is it has very real world implications. 
uh, most compellingly when we look to the Gabrielle Giffords shooting uh, just over a year ago and Jared Lee Lochner, the man who shot Giffords and 12 others on that day. He was immediately compared in the mass media by a longtime friend of his as the Joker, as someone who was very similar to this villainous character. So when we are making decisions about what to do with Lochner, about whether he deserves medical care, whether he deserves to be put to death as being evil, all of a sudden we're invoking these very rich cultural models of what we understand about the Joker, and about whether he's evil or whether he's ill, or whether we could change the world and provide better care or better choices. So all of a sudden, it's not the same fears we're so used to hearing that all media does is give us models for violence and models to copycat the Joker's bad behavior. It's much more than that. It's giving us models to interpret the world, to better understand ourselves, it's being used in psychotherapy, to better understand legal cases like Lochner's, to better understand our own identity. You can see it in Harry Potter fan fiction, uh, in Glee, the community is a lot more lighthearted <laughs> examples than the Joker. But that's what has excited me about this book. and uh, and. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll hear from some of the other ways it's been employed, too. Thank you. Laura? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Laurel Felt. I'm a fourth year doctoral candidate here at Annenberg, and I also work with Henry. That's why I'm sitting at the table. <laughs> um, this, this book was a revelation, as was the Henry himself. I took his class, New Media Literacy, as my second year here <coughs> because I heard he was pretty famous. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it changed the direction of my scholarship materially. And uh, my background, in addition to a closeted sort of Harry Potter fan, I've read all the books many times, um, I had been a preschool teacher and I got my degree in child development. And in that space, we were pretty darn worried about what kids were doing with media. And if there was something materially different that was going on in contemporary childhoods than for um, my parents growing up during the 60s or for me growing up during the 80s, which was a time of children's television deregulation, so G.I. Joe action figures were prolific, but still G.I. Joe wasn't all over the fruit snacks and uh, the lunch boxes and all sorts of other types in a child's universe. And so does that mean that we need to step up and play the role of protector? Is there something nefarious about media culture today? That's what brought me to doctoral study initially. And through my explorations with Henry and from this book, I came to appreciate, just like it sounds Francesca did in terms of her understandings of the Joker, that it's not so black and white what people do with media and which media we're talking about because it's a real mixed bag uh, makes a very significant difference. So in this book, Chapter 5, Why Heather Can Write, what resonated for me was this theme of what role we should play in children's lives in order to realize our best intentions, which is where everyone's operating from. <coughs> we want them to grow up to be healthy and strong, to be able to realize their potential and their ambitions. How do we do that? Does that mean creating a walled garden? Does that mean surrendering the keys to the castle? Or more complicatedly, does that mean entering in some sort of negotiated conversation in which we talk to them about things that are emerging and what they're doing and how to handle decision making? I think that most difficult third option is the way to go. And that's what this book also suggests. <laughs> Additionally, in that chapter, it speaks about a participation gap, which was also part of a 2006 publication from Henry and colleagues. And that gap refers to the unequal access to the opportunities, experiences, skills, and knowledge that will prepare youth for full participation in the world of tomorrow. And unfortunately, this participation gap usually runs along socioeconomic and racial lines. So that uh, the rich keep getting richer, the kids who have everything indeed keep on getting more. They have high-speed internet at home, they have computers at home, they have savvy parents, they have the best school systems that are updated with cutting-edge equipment, and so they're engaging in these online spaces and having opportunities, just like Heather and Flourish did in Chapter 5, to reach out and speak with global peers, to engage with ideas, to hone their writing skills, to play the roles of student and mentor, to engage in this really robust context of participatory learning. And while children in less privileged circumstances might sometimes be able to get online at school on an old computer or for a few minutes at the library, their access is really much <laughs> less rich than, than kids who have more time and kids who have 
access to mentors who can show them the full powers of the internet. So this presents uh, a context for intervention. Uh, people who care need to step and up and do something. <coughs> and that's what we've done in the Participatory Learning and You, or PLAY, research group here at USC. Uh, we've created a whole host of programs in order to try to foster contexts of participatory learning where individuals in the community can appreciate and uh, access heightened motivation and engagement, engage with creativity, um, explore co-learning, what it feels like to be the expert at times, the learner at times, regardless of age, but more about interest and skill. They can also explore using their learning ecosystem and bringing some of the knowledge that they've acquired from <coughs> informal learning spaces and home into the classroom and have it be appreciated. And they can even further investigate it, extend it, bring it back out to home, have those rich conversations with parents that we know are so key in fostering intellectualism and academic engagement, and keep on moving. So, some of the programs that we've done with PLAY are an after-school program at uh, the RFK Community Schools in downtown Los Angeles. We called it Explore Locally, Excel Digitally. And in this program, which ran for 15 weeks after school, we worked with primarily high school freshmen on digital citizenship and acquiring appreciation of the uh, participatory practices of participatory culture. And I'll leave that list for you to look up because there's so many words involved. <laughs> uh, after that experience, we thought that we might harness some of the intelligence of the students and use them to inform a professional development experience for their teachers. <coughs> what happens if students have the opportunity to speak up and say, this is what we wish teachers knew. This is what we wish teachers would do in the classroom. So over the summer, we offered two single weeks <coughs> of uh, the Summer Sandbox, which was an intensive five-day seminar for LAUSD teachers in participatory learning. About half of those teachers elected to continue working with us this past fall in a program called Playing Outside the Box, in which they received uh, an opportunity to deepen their appreciation of participatory learning and benefit from community building and mentorship. We have also continued with programming <coughs> at the RFK community schools through the device of play on workshops in which we've worked with community partners in a constellation of high, low, and no tech modalities um, using computer animation, um, improvisation, and community, community storytelling via multimedia for youth and educators alike to uh, practice some of these skills and to appreciate what it feels like to be in a participatory learning culture. And we've continued with the improvisation workshop this uh, semester as well because student interest was so robust and co-learning along with adults has continued to occur. Um, I myself am a participant in it. So we're hoping to be the change that we hope to see in the world and to help to bridge the participation gap by bringing this culture and these values and these strategies of working through participatory learning to the real world. Okay. My name is Kevin Driscoll. I'm a third year PhD student also. Um, I'm sitting here partially as a member of a research group called Civic Paths, of which uh, Henry is the director. I think that's the right title. And I, I wanted to share two projects that we've worked on that resonate a lot with my recent rereading of Convergence Culture. One project that we finished and one that is emerging. Um, the first project is, is a smaller scale one, and it really uh, connects with the chapter about <coughs> spoiling survivor. So I'll quickly summarize this in case you haven't uh, read the book recently, but uh, in the survivor spoilers chapter, we learn about a group of fans of the TV show Survivor, who for them, part of the pleasure of the show is trying to anticipate who's gonna be voted off. They wanna know the order, they wanna know wh why, what happened, and so they go to great lengths, in some cases getting satellite maps or you know, <laughs> culling through phone books trying to figure out um, who lost a little bit of weight. Just all sorts of different ways of finding clues of who might have um, come off the show. So in the, way that, in the way the chapter is structured, you learn about this group through a close reading of threads on a message board called Survivor Sucks. And it's a message board that's on the web, and it was run by the fans, populated by the fans. But you get the sense that producers of the show also knew about it. So it's this kind of interesting contested space where you have a place that there's more people reading it than are necessarily posting on it. 
And Henry in the, in the book talks a lot about the affordances of the platform to encourage a kind of collective intelligence activity. So the people are bringing all their clues together and then they have a certain durability in this place. So it's conversational, but then you can see the record of the conversation. So in the past, I've returned to this chapter because I was interested in, in message boards and I wanted to know about the possibilities for message boards as communicative spaces and where communities can see themselves. But this time when I was rereading it, I was struck by this one line that, that emerges just a few pages from the end. And it's the first sentence in a paragraph, but it's not a heading or anything like that. And it reads, um, imagine the kinds of information these fans could collect if they sought to spoil the government rather than the television networks. So you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an interesting line, stuck out for me. And it, when you think about some of the, uh, the, the events that have taken place of the past few years around collecting clues, bringing them together, groups of people who, who form autonomously around a shared interest and try to make sense of things, we see practices like doxing, that is the thing where people who identify as part of anonymous gather just tons and tons of information about a certain person and, and put it into a public place. Um, or WikiLeaks where other kinds of clues came together into a single place. The project that I worked on in Civic Paths is, is in some ways more humble, but also it's kind of like hinge for me. And it almost seems like had you written Convergence Culture a year later, maybe this project would have fit into the mix. So there was a group that I was looking at that was called uh, the Living Room Rock Gods. And some images of them are, are floating around here, but they're rock fans. And they would make uh, band, virtual bands on YouTube where multiple people would play along using different instruments to the same CD. And then they could sync it all together and get rid of the original recording. So they would have this like virtual band. But one member could be in Mexico City, one member is in Canada, one more member is in LA. Um, and they had this whole rich archive of videos over time. And some of the users had 60 or more videos on their accounts. And in one weekend in January, many of them lost dozens of videos to, due to copyright takedowns. And it, was, it was, had nothing to do with their group necessarily. It was about negotiations over advertising and industry machinations that are completely apart seeming from the fan culture that had been happening around Living Room Rock Gods. Oh, this is a, that was an image of, of Zodiac Iron Fist, who's the next character in this story. And Zodiac was a very active uh, Living Room Rock God, and he was, because of his activity, one of the most hard hit by these copyright takedowns. And he was also somebody who started a message board wholly apart from YouTube. And he would find other people on YouTube who were doing similar things and invite them to come to the message board. So whereas the copyright takedowns removed nodes from the network on YouTube so they lost connectivity, they were able to stay in touch with each other through the message board. And they would come and say, I just lost five Primus videos. What's going on here? And the, and the message board provide a platform for them to find one another and collect information, not only on the fact that they were being hit by these copyright takedowns, but also how to get in touch with lawyers, how to speak the language of copyright in order to contest them to argue for their fair use rights and get their videos returned. And over time, they turned their fan interest from the Living Room Rock Gods into an actual campaign they called Tribute Is Not Theft, where, um, like that image showed, they spoke to their cameras and they spoke directly to musicians in the mm -hmm. bands. And their, their rhetoric was, was very interesting because it was an appeal to the musician rather than to the label or anybody like that. And they just said, do you know that other drummers, other bass <coughs> players are having our music taken down? And, it, and it's because of our appreciation for you. We want to let you know. And over time, they actually had numerous videos restored on YouTube. So whereas other communities were devastated by these <coughs> copyright takedowns, their use of a fan-owned platform wholly apart from YouTube enabled them to have be more powerful actors within that private network. So that was my uh, one story that was the one we'd done already. The emerging one is, a, is a, a bigger project, but I have less to say about it, which is that we've been, tr we've been collecting with the help of the Innovation Lab just a enormous number of tweets related to Occupy Wall Street. And we have something ranging in the number of 13 million right now. And a lot of those tweets have links in them, attached to them. And a lot of those links terminate at a YouTube video. So we've also been collecting, using the same rule set, the same keywords, um, videos from YouTube. So we have these two lists of YouTube videos. One is the list of videos that have Occupy Wall Street 
tags or, or words on them on YouTube. And the other one is things that people on Twitter link <coughs> to in an Occupy Wall Street related message. And when you, do, when you do an intersection of these, you find you have all these funny videos that show up in the Twitter data that have nothing to do with Occupy Wall Street in them on the YouTube side. And it's because somebody will say like, oh, it's a cold morning in Zuccotti Park today. Here's a song to warm everybody up. <laughs> and then they use YouTube to link to a song. If you look at the, the video for the, the, the page for the video, you'd never know that that had any meaning inside of the Occupy camp. You have to have that whole media ecology where you see the circulation of artifacts across platforms. Mm -hmm. That for the, from the user point of view, you have multiple tabs open and you don't really see the boundaries necessary, necessarily between these places. The meaning and the expressive use of the artifacts is somehow apart from the kind of industrial breakdown of where one platform begins and one ends. So it's very interesting to see how there, there was the seed of that spreadable circulation notion in, buried inside of convergence culture. And it's going to be interesting to see it blossom shortly in the new book. And it's exciting for me to see my fellow like, grad students so excited and passionate mm -hmm. about all our different projects and like, us finding what people are finding as part of the interesting process. Um, so my name is Meryl Alper, and I am a second year PhD student. Um, so not yet at the dissertation stage, but thinking about a lot of different projects and how to seed them. Part of it is with Henry through my research assistant position at the Annenberg Innovation Lab, um, which I encourage you to check out downstairs on the first floor in the corner, um, if you have not yet already on your tour, new students. Um, so um, I thought I'd kind of talk about uh, a chapter in particular related to transmedia. Um, that has particularly shaped my work, um, how it relates to uh, specifically my interest in children, youth, and media, which is the track that I'm in at, at the Anberg Innovation Lab, and my background is in that as well. And uh, some future projects at USC and even beyond this day and beyond this lab, if you wanted to get involved as well. So, uh, so the chapter that uh, kind of for me most relates to transmedia is this searching for the origami unicorn. Does anybody know what that origami unicorn uh, is a reference to? Anybody? Sure. What? Oh, from Blade Runner. From Blade Runner. The origami unicorn usually represents that someone's a replicant, and in one version of the film, it signals that the main character may be in another director's. It's in one of the two. One cut features it to signify one thing, but the other cut does not. Yeah. So it invites speculation on sort of what were intentions, <coughs> and of course, What's the conversation around those intentions? And when you take it out of that context, what meaning does it have at that point? Um, so, so, and transmedia literally means, we just talked about across media. But when you sort of add another word to the end of that, it's cross, so stories potentially, transmedia storytelling, which is a lot of what Harry talks about in this book. Um, but transmedia as learning, um, as Laurel has, you know, has talked about as well. And um, what are the different worlds that kids tell stories about the different, uh, things that they're learning in school and, of course, informally outside of school. Um, transmedia, when it relates to activism, um, talking a little bit about um, what Kevin's talked about in, in terms of disability studies as well, how do people advocate for a position within the context of perhaps louder voices or voices that get, that get to talk more? Um, and how do all these voices, how do you make sense of the cacophony of information that we're all really sort of, that we have every day? It's not a lack of information. It's how we curate and who gets to curate um, on something like YouTube or um, who gets access to Photoshop that can pay for it or not. Um, so the, uh, so in, in fact, transmedia is that each piece of the story can stand alone. You know, each YouTube video, each, uh, each image has its own sort of context. But then once you sort of are able to understand the whole breadth of the story, and perhaps never will be able to, um, but how you sort of frame what that story world is about um, and uh, how you reinterpret it and how you reconsider it, um, that that sort of, uh, that life that's given to it um, has definitely sort of shaped the, the, the products that we, that, that uh, Hollywood just down up the street makes, that people make in their living rooms, um, and also globally. We haven't really necessarily talked about that too, but the, the global shape of this book as Henry's sort of stack of books there alludes to in all the different languages. And that's another thing I've gotten from Henry is it's really impressive when you walk into a room and you're talking about a topic and you have like a stack of, of <laughs> books that are all related to the topic. So your library can travel everywhere. Um, actually, I 
kind of took a little cue. I was like, I should bring some extra stuff. Um, that does talk about creative media. Um, and Henry has talked about, Marsha Kinder, who's also here, who's in the, the cinema school as well, has talked about in relation to children and, uh, and their relationships to sort of mass media texts. And uh, sort of what, what kind of story worlds kids talk about, how you know, if you tell stories to kids about you know, what's on your lunchbox, what toys do you play with, that becomes a way that kids build communities. Um, and not necessarily judging in what shape those stories take, but also not looking at this play as unfettered. Um, that there are adult sensibilities that shape what are those texts that kids as that source material, what labor conditions have gone into the construction of those toys, what you know, economic political factors shape what's available in your online space. So in this negotiation between adult and child, um, which for me before I came to grad school here, I was a, I worked as a researcher for Sesame Street and for Nickelodeon and was part of a programming strategy team for Disney Channel. Um, so this straddling between industry and academia and taking insight that you gain from all these different worlds. And, and I would say, especially for new students too, it's valuable, whatever you come in with, pieces in unexpected ways will sort of leap together. Um, so that then kind of carries into um, uh, the projects that I'm working on specifically here at the Innovation Lab. Um, a project, and some images have gone by, of a book called Flotsam, um, which is a wordless picture book. Um, so a lot of opportunities for a story that is untold uh, in, terms of t in terms of words, but visually is very rich. And it's essentially a story about media change. It's about a, ca a camera that literally travels. Um, and each kid sort of imprints themselves onto the last picture within a picture within a picture. And uh, there's all sorts of ways that it's been adapted and taken up by schools, by libraries, by you know, kids and, and parents at home. And so we're thinking about how it's actually a story about a lot of things, about media change, about marine biology, and how transmedia learning, um, how, to, how to sort of build from the ground up a property that leaves enough sort of empty space for kids to fill in to tell their story, um, but at the same time isn't completely structureless and devoid of um, scaffolding. Um, so, uh, so, so relate to that. And again, if you wanted to jump off and learn more about this transmedia stuff, A, I would suggest Henry's blog, which again, another model of like things that we're learning as PhD students, um, to sort of be engaging as academics in a, in, in a source that isn't necessarily the yeah, academic journals, but um, also takes advantage of the rapid pace at which we can think critically, but also disseminate widely. Um, and uh, so on Henry's blog, you can find out more about a Transmedia Hollywood conference that's going to be here as a joint venture between USC and UCLA, April 6th. Um, it's being organized by some fellow PhD students as well. Um, so, and that engagement is not just about engaging with industry, but also the larger uh, uh, LA academic community as well. Um, and that's another thing that we all take forward with us beyond the city and thinking globally as well. Thank you all. That it's so. It, I can't tell you the pride that I feel hearing these four students talk about the impact of my work on theirs and and what they give me back on a regular basis. And looking out here, I see a number of other students who could have been up here and could have told stories that that are equally rich about the kinds of research culture that we're creating here here at USC. Uh, Meryl just mentioned the blog. I should brag about another whole group of students that some of you know the story of Coney 2012, uh, which has hit incredible rapid success. It's, it's a 30-minute documentary about human rights violations in Uganda that has now been seen by more people in a fat, shorter period of time than the Susan Boyle video, to give you just a point of comparison. And it's distributed by a group called Invisible Children. Well, our team had been, and the Civic Pass team, has been researching invisible children for th at least three, for three years now, uh, in part shaped by Melissa Brow, who brought it to our attention. I think it was a paper originally she did for Sarah Benet Weiser's uh, commodity activism book. Uh, and we were able, in under a week's time, to get a pretty rich portfolio of materials about invisible children up that involved five, six of the grad students in the Civic Pass group through my blog and it's been picked up and used all over now as journalists and uh, intellectuals have started to respond to that. And this is again something we can do in the context of, of the Annenberg School, which you know, one of the things I lacked at MIT was PhD students. And I think there's an incredibly rich group 
of PhD students here at Annenberg that we can talk to. So now is the point where we open this up to you. We brought a bunch of questions for you, but I also, I'm assuming by this point, you have questions that you'd like to ask to some of the people here in the table. So maybe we should start with that, and if we have time, we'll throw some, some questions we thought about to, to get you guys engaged more. What about some of these new perspectives? The guy, the guy, the, the guy that answers the question with the striped oh. shirt, yeah. No, that's not a He's fourth year. <laughs> I think you've seen him before. Yeah, I know. I, but but you're, you're, you're the victim. You're in the front row. Okay, well, Henry and I are actually working on a project uh, taking um, the ideas of issues of collective intelligence and applying it to the classrooms. Last spring, Henry he, uh, he, uh, taught a course on communication and technology and was faced with the dilemma of, well, I can't, we want students to use technology, but an open laptop exam would allow for student to collaboration. So Henry's taking his theories of collective intelligence and I'm taking the work I do in studying uh, shared cognition and transactive memory systems and figuring out ways to possibly design exams to leverage collective intelligence. So students learn together throughout the semester, take their exams together, utilize cultural, technological artifacts, and we are writing a book chapter that's being edited by a professor over at the education school. So we're really, at, we're at this point, we're in a thought experiment stage, and then we're hoping um, next fall when Henry teaches the course again to actually implement it and test, is this a wacky idea, or is this actually something that, um, Effects are, uh, help, helps our students actually understand conference better. So I have a question maybe then, talking about what makes you learn conference better. Has anybody here learned anything from YouTube? <coughs> and what? I'm learning how to play the drums from YouTube. All I do is put in whatever song I want to play, and, and I put the Kinks drum cover, and it comes up on my iPad. I have like three to choose from. I put on my headphones and I sit at the drum kit and like learn a song from someone. And it's incredible. Like, and my boyfriend, he fixes um, vintage amplifiers and he he can find anything he wants on YouTube. And there are people out there that contribute so much to like, the, the how to. Like, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A friend of mine who's a PhD candidate at Yale is. Uh, is specializes in Haiti and is teaching actually, uh, just for fun, a course on Creole on YouTube. Uh, so she's teaching language to anybody who cares to tune in. So she's got uh, Creole and Haitian culture. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add as a theoretical concept or in a different direction. It seems to me that one of the ideas that relates to all of this and some of the things we've about is the notion of a gift economy. And it doesn't get discussed too often, but it's, it's a very old anthropological concept that there are many ways in which cultures depend upon the exchange of gifts, and often indirect exchanges. In <coughs> it's not like you know, a, a reciprocal barter, but you put it in, you know, it's like that pay it forward right. idea. Right. And what I think the, these new technologies have, have um, facilitated is for people to easily engage in gift economies to benefit from them, and your example there is a good one, and to participate in it. Because the thing that struck me about the internet, you know, early 90s, or you know, mid 90s, when it you know, sort of suddenly emerged, was how quickly it became a, just a treasure house of knowledge and resources about things. I mean, it, did, it took, you know, maybe I don't know, one or two years before you could just go and search <laughs> under the most obscure topics and find people had created websites and put all this information up. And, there were, it was as if there were all of these people with stuff to share, probably that their you know, relatives and neighbors were bored hearing about, and, <laughs> and suddenly they could now share with anyone. And I think a large part of the phenomena that, um, that uh, Henry is talking about here, or that, that you're all talking about, is enriching and rewarding mm. this kind of interchange, which is, I mean, getting back to you know, Henry's early you know, sort of conflict, is very much different than the capitalist, everything being a market, you know, kind of, it's a non-market exchange, but it's one in which people readily engage, and I think that's really one of its really hidden uh, uh, resources 
that we've all, in a way, come to take for granted. Uh, and I think from the point of view of you know, sort of development or you know, looking at the kind of world children grow up into, growing up in a world in which that kind of thing is so familiar and taken for granted <coughs> at a young age must have consequences. I mean, I hope. Yeah, Larry, you're going to really like the spreadable media book because there's a whole <laughs> chapter that really builds the gift economy arguments out and really explores them in more depth. And in part, it's also the chapter that's critiquing Web 2.0 uh, because it's trying to understand, you know, in a traditional society, gift economy is the economy. In our context, gift economies exist alongside commercial economies. And I think part of the problem of the Web 2.0 discourse was it papered over the relations between them, that O'Reilly in describing what is Web 2.0 really just imagines an easy match up between why people give things to each other and how companies can make money off of those exchanges. And we've seen every Web 2.0 company crash and come up with enormous resistances from their audiences and consumer base over precisely these issues. So in a normal course of things in our society, when we give someone a gift, Nine times out of ten, we bought it at a store. So it begins as a commodity and becomes a gift. Uh, and the magic moment, I think, is when we remove the price tag, right? That we sort of say, this is no longer about what we paid for it. It's about the social relations we're facilitating between it. But the question of when something that is a gift then goes back into the commercial culture is a much more problematic one. If I give you something and you discover the next day you're selling it on eBay, I'm probably deeply hurt because it's clear you value the economic nature of the exchange over the social nature of the exchange. Yeah. But in the course of any spread of media now, what we're seeing is a constant movement back and forth between them, and some of those are more char some of those movements are more charged than others. Yeah. Actually, an early version of that, which I dealt with twenty something years ago, in this book Image Ethics, was think of um, the, the migrant Madonna, you know, the Dorothy mm. photograph mm. of the. Uh, of the migrant worker or any of those photographs. You know, people are photographed, there's a kind of exchange, uh, and people are happy to be photographed when they find out that that photograph is now worth you know, thousands of dollars and that they have no ownership right in it, which they don't. Uh, but copyright law, it often creates an ethical and a, and a, and a kind of you know, sort of personal conflict that never existed before. People are happy to be photographed and they're happy to have it out there. They're, they don't know how to feel about it when it turns out to have a, an exchange value that is very different from, from that. And the whole question shows up a lot in anthropology. Of what do you owe to the people whose lives are the raw material of your scholarship? Right. This also affects the debates about free labor that have been so, so much in vogue in critical studies right now because they act as if the problem with the labor is that it's not paid for, which is that it has to be understood in relation to a commodity capitalism system. And there are plenty of labor we do as a set of social and effective relationships we don't want to be paid for. That if you have a hot date and you wake up the next morning and there's a hundred dollar bill on your dresser, <laughs> you know, you don't feel better about the experience because you were paid for it, right? You, you, <laughs> you know, uh, that it changes something fundamental about that relationship. And so calling that free labor may misunderstand the nature of the exchange that's taking place. Something else that this brings up for me, bringing a couple of these threads together, is about the limits of learning and different categories of learning, which has this important piece about value in it, where sometimes there is a way of thinking about the availability of training on the internet, or facts, that that's something we don't have to worry about. We can plan our project, and along the way, we'll learn everything we need. So it's like if I was driving a car, and then I could just look on my phone on how to fix a flat. I don't need to learn how to fix a flat before I leave. Whereas, a, for example, like a, a language like Creole or playing drums, there's something about it that is apart from just learning the mechanics of those two things. For example, like Creole is such an expressive language that even learning the meaning of all the words won't give you the rich colloquialisms that are at play. Or drums has so much of a, a muscular piece. It's such an athletic activity that you have to do it a lot to be able to do it well, even if somebody tells you the sequence of things to hit. And, and so when we talk about free labor in, in certain ways, there's like some kinds of labor that seems free and some ways that we, it almost seems like we need a new regime of value to be able to measure those kinds of learning that don't quite fit in, like the, the, the ability to, to joke around with somebody in Creole versus converse and exchange data with them in Creole. 
Let me just intervene for a quick second, because one of the purposes was to think about ways in which these conversations can reach across the various schools and so forth within the, uh, uh, or, or programs within the school. So Henry, I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you see the relevance of your work um, for journalism and potentially uh, strategic public relations, since you not only have cross-university appointments, but you also have an appointment in the journalism sure. school as well as in the no, I, th I, think, I think one implication of this research is that we all need to have expertise across the various sectors of the Annenberg School and that our students should cross-pollinate across those. Another is very clearly that in a world that we used to prepare students for print journalism versus broadcast journalism versus digital journalism is not adequate for a world where journalism is transmedia, right? And you've got to actually have all of those skills and be able to communicate across them. Another dimension, I think, on the journalism side is the role of so-called citizen journalism, which is a term I absolutely loathe, uh, but uh, the, the notion of a more participatory journalism culture. And I love, loathe the term citizen journalism for multiple reasons. One is that I think journalists are already citizens, and the minute they stop, the minute they stop thinking of themselves as citizens and say, those guys are citizens and we're professional, they lose track of something pretty fundamental about their mission within the society. I also don't like this implication that everyone who's not a journalist is somehow pretending to be a journalist when they write online. And when I do my blog, I'm not a fake journalist. <laughs> I'm an academic who's choosing to share my knowledge with society. And the same is true if I were a lawyer or a doctor or a car mechanic or anyone else. That I think we use that word, which is a bit like horseless carriage, uh, transition word that to try to describe what's coming in terms of what's been. But I, I you know, try in the civic media class that I teach to help journalists and communication students to really think together about what the new communication environment's going to look like. On the PR side, we're gonna be I'm going to be teaching a PR course next spring uh, that grows out of the Spreadable Media book and hopefully we'll be co-teaching co it with a PR uh, professional of some sort. We're still working out the details on this to really explore how does the shifting communication environment impact the kinds of messages that organizations and individuals and companies need to send out to the world. And I think this book in particular that's being co-authored with Sam Ford is a, works for Peppercom Communications in New York as a PR firm. And uh, Joshua Green works for Madison Avenue Branding Consultancy. And so it has a lot of implications for the world of branding, the world of public communication, and so forth. But it also has a pretty deep strand of critical theory running through it that um, and no doubt was heavily shaped by having Sarah Benet Weiser as a thinking partner as we wrote our books in parallel to each other. And we've had a very constructive back and forth. We don't necessarily agree on everything, but that's what makes it such a really great conversation to be having inside the context of the Annenberg School. Yes, sir. Just wondering if you could speak to the, for lack of a better term, the political economy of the Web 3.0, the filter bubble, the semantic web, so to speak, and the fact that it has unwittingly allowed the audience participation to become uh, an automatic entry into an online economy where they are afforded you know, unlimited surveillance by advertisers. And I don't want to pathologize this behavior, but it is something that I think people are unaware of, even as all of the, the, the paradigms and all of the, 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 um, the, the, the uh, devices that we're using now are conforming to that technology and that access. Yeah, I said at the beginning that part of what I prophesize in the book, and I, I'm not, I use the word prophesize with limited, limited value. They confiscated my crystal ball when I left MIT, so I, I can't do that as well as I used to. But uh, what part of my claim was that we were living in an increasingly participatory culture, but the terms of our participation would be under dispute. There's a new book out of a Dutch scholar called Bastard Cultures, which is really laying, sort of takes participatory culture and the convergence culture to task for focusing on voluntary and knowing forms of participation. And he's using this notion of implicit and involuntary participation to describe that process that you're talking about. And, and that stuff disturbs me greatly. I, I'm disturbed by it when I read about it in Mark Andreevich's work as well, who's also been critical of some of the framing. And I think in constructive ways. That is, 
the way the lack of transparency, the lack of knowledge we have of the way data gets extracted from us undercuts a lot of the claims that Web 2.0 is making. Uh, in the book, Spreadable Media, we t I use the analogy of the barn raising as a kind of communal ritual which involves exchange of labor and even the production of economic value in a social context. But then I said, how does that look differently if you are, if, if, say, you're paying people to work in your barn? I mean, you're, I mean, you're charging people to work in your barn. Or you're collecting, you're charging other people to, 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 so you can put advertising in the barn while it's going up so that they get to watch your advertising. Or you create a concession where you sell them the drinks that they need to drink while they're working in your barn. And I walked through all of the different models of Web 2.0, and I think we'd agree that the fundamental exchange that a barn raising depends on are incredibly altered by the introduction of these kinds of capitalist mechanisms that are deeply damaging to the communities that they are part of. And often these are imposed without any knowledge and without any consent from the community. We add to that what Trevor Schultz talks about, which is locking down of content, the, the inability to move your data once you're there, or your social relations once you're there from one portal to the other, which makes it really, really difficult for people to just get up and leave. That said, I don't, what I resist in a lot of the critical studies work is the sense of passivity or total ignorance, right? We've seen around these Web 2.0 companies large consumer pushbacks, quite organized network consumer pushbacks around issues of intellectual property, censorship, privacy, and data mining, that people are, org are educating each other about these issues. Kevin Story, Louis Rockrobs Gods is a pretty good example of that, and are using these tools to organize and resist. And I think that resistance gets left out of a lot of the more critical accounts of what's taking place. So I, I think having a notion of participatory culture that you can then use to critique these other practices is incredibly useful. It doesn't mean it's a naive and utopian notion, but it means we have some sense of what an ideal would look like against which we can measure and critique sets of contemporary practices which fall far short of those ideals. And I think fans and consumers have often been the sharpest critic of these practices, not, not the passive recipients of these practices. Let me use that uh, perhaps as a, as a moment to uh, thank Henry and his colleagues. And I think what we, we hear around the table is the, uh, the breaking down of of academic categories, of rigid academic categories, uh, both between the academy and outside of the academy and within the academy as well. And so I would like to declare uh, this, uh, this initial event uh, a success because it has broken down. I want to thank the, 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 the group for their, uh, for their participation and their, and their leadership. Thank you.